our program to our panel. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Casey Ryan from Riverview Community Bank. And Casey, go ahead and come on up. And this panel is of East County businesses, and they're going to talk about some of the examples in their workplaces of what's happening with the generations and also um, some of their succession planning. And um, we're so pleased to have Riverview as a panel sponsor, but also, you know, Riverview was um, honored this year by the Portland Business Journal as one of the region's um, most philanthropic companies. And they also received the Chamber's uh, 2012 um, Business Excellence Award for Small Companies. So with that, I'd like to welcome Casey to the podium, and he will introduce our panelists. Nobody wants to follow Stacy. I can tell you that. I got one really quick story. So you were the only traditionalist that stood up, uh, Warren. So last week I was going to grow my beard out and Warren saw me at a luncheon and told me he was going to take me out back with a K bar. And <laughs> <laughs> you notice I shaved. <laughs> I'm not even sure what a K bar is. So, <laughs> so uh, Lynn Steven, Stefan, I'm sorry. Uh, there you are, okay. And uh, Mike Starr, please, uh, Director of Manufacturing of the Boeing Company. I'm sorry, uh, Lynn Steffens, uh, the man Manufacturing Training and OD Manager with Microchip. And Josh Heinerfeld, CEO of Organically Grown Company. Please welcome to the stage. And so let's start at the far uh, with you, Lynn, and just a, a brief introduction of your role at the company and your bio, please, right. and then we'll just go right down the, the line. My name is Lynn Steffen, and I'm the Manufacturing Training and Organizational Manager for Microchip Technology. I've been with Microchip for 16 years. Uh, they moved me up from Arizona 11 years ago to start the training organization here in the Gresham facility off of Stark, and uh, everybody who starts a microchip comes through my office, so... I get to see a lot of different people and help them be successful at our company. Um, Mike Starr, I'm a native Oregonian, uh, born and raised in Clownal Falls. I've worked for Boeing for 24 years. Um, it's my pleasure to lead the site here in Gresham as well as our site in Boeing, Aaron in Helena. Hi, I'm Josh Heinerfeld, and um, I just want you to understand that I may have stood up as, with the, the, the baby boomer generation, but I actually feel that I'm a member of the Generation Y, because I ask why a lot. Um, I've been with Organically Grown Company, uh, it's my eighth year, and uh, we're a distributor of organic produce, primarily to retailers. Thank you. So uh, what we're going to do is I have a series of questions I'm going to ask, and uh, they'll each uh, have a reply, and then we'll save the question and answer for the end. We've got about 45 minutes to get through this, so we want to save a fair amount of time at the end to be able to ask questions. So. Um, and I will be keeping an eye on Allison, so you know to keep me on, uh, on, on task. So the first question, let's start with Mike in the middle from Boeing. Uh, can you talk about what is changing in your industry and how, that, how this shifted the push-pull points of your workforce supply? So in manufacturing, probably the biggest change that we've seen is the acceleration of technology within the machines, the processes, the, the computer systems, and the... Um, the lack of traditional training institutions to be able to keep up with that. Um, so that requires us to develop internal training systems to uh, collaborate with Mount Hood's a great one, um, as well as other charter VOTEC type schools to try to get supplemental learning or tailored learning to our systems. Um, and then what we find even after that is, is, is the folks that come in, um, new folks, their level of knowledge, their, their ability to work with these advanced systems, um, they're, they're just not um, there yet. So it, you have to be very patient and allow these folks to, to learn and uh, to be efficient at these. So it's, it's probably just it's, that technology is going so much faster than, than the um, support systems to teach people. Uh, Lynn? We have something similar. Uh, the automation that's happened in our facilities over the years has certainly broadened the gap of skill sets that are needed. Um, it's lowered the skill set for an entry-level position because everything is handled behind the scenes now, but it's increased the uh, need for our technicians to know more about robotics and, and automation and things that are happening behind the scenes to fix them. 
So um, while we see we don't have so much of trouble of having new hires come in as entry level, we're going to run into a situation where we lose that skill set of technicians to be able to fix these newer, faster, better machines. Joshua? Yeah, so I want to kind of frame, put our business in context. So if I think compared to our, your two businesses, you know, we're right at the decimal point. We have a little over 200 employees at this point. But what we're dealing with in, in our business is it's a really quickly evolving and growing industry. And just to kind of put things in perspective, um, you know, the organic food industry was about a $3.6 billion industry in 1997. And by 2011, that was a $31.5 billion industry. So you've got an industry that's growing at you know, almost 16% compounded annually. We've been growing just as fast, and so our issue is, is managing growth and how do you evolve, you know, was essentially it was a small business to keep up with the growth and mature the business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I, what I looked at, you know, this question, it's, it, we're really looking at this at three levels. One is we've got the challenge of how do we build out our senior team because now, you know, we've gone from, you know, you know in eight years we've, we've pretty much quadrupled our, our business. So I need to make sure that we're bringing in, you know, senior leadership that actually has, you know, the skills, the experience, the scar tissue that they've gleaned from, you know, bigger businesses that they can then turn, you know, interleave with our company. In the middle level, what we found is that we need people with, you know, trade experience and, and the organic produce. And really what we're looking for is when we bring people in from the outside is injecting some expertise that we lack and then working with talent that we're building from within. And then at the, you know, the entry level, we kind of do have a, a similar challenge in that we're becoming much, much more technologically driven in our company with systems, warehouse management systems. So we need to find staff that you know, are adept and, and willing to, to work with the technology um, and you know, can hit the ground running. So you know, we've got the, this kind of push-pull now at three different levels in the context of really managing quick growth. Anybody else want to add anything to that question? I think the other thing that, that what we struggle with is, is hiring very quickly for when we upturn quickly. So our, up, our, our industry is maturing. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we were growing double digits all the time. And so there was a sp expected growth every year. And that's now changed. Uh, we're in a much more mature industry. And so our growth is slower. So keeping up with economic requirements and customer demand, when we have to hire, we have to hire quickly, and we don't always have um, enough advance notice to have that good pipeline in place. So sometimes it feels like we're catching up our behind. Okay. Is that anything else? Okay. Uh, second question. Are you seeing a shift in diversity with, you, with your workforce, such as culture and age? How have you adapted your strategy to increase workforce productivity, retention, and leadership? Let's start with Josh. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. We, um, Amy Bergner actually just joined us, who manages a lot of our staffing at the Gresham facility. So uh, she can give me the, the, you know, some looks if I'm off track here with the questions. But, but you know, you, you know we, um, we've worked closely over the years with Cascade Employers. It's a nonprofit uh, organization based in Salem that does a lot of um, HR, OD, consulting. And one of the services that we used of, uh, from Cascade is uh, their engagement survey. So, you know, t typically every year we conduct this as staff engagement survey. And, you know, what we found through this process is our staff is really, really committed to our mission and our core values. And that becomes kind of a, it's, it's a great calling card when we're trying to, you know, recruit people. But once we have the, the folks, on, uh, you know, on staff, the question is, what are we going to do to keep them there? And, you know, I think that the presentation about the, the challenges of, dealing with more diverse workforce really applies to us. We've got a very young workforce. Um, you know, I was doing that you know, demographic uh, analysis and we've got a lot of millennials. And for us, what we kind of gleaned from that, you know, the engagement survey is we need to find a way to make them feel really, really good and empowered in, in our workplace. So what are we trying to do? We were a company that started with a bunch of hippies. I mean, let's just call it, right? I wasn't one of them, but, you know, <laughs> I'm on the tail end of that generation. And, you know, it's, it's that, what I call the aging group of, the, the prime group of hippies, 
you know, who really are the keepers of the mission, the flame, and we're trying to find a way to how do we create that bridge really to the millennials? Mm -hmm. How do we take that founding generation who's really carrying the torch of who we are, why we exist, and migrate that to the, the, the new generation of, of staff? So what we're trying to do is really cultivate um, a structure where that can happen, where our founders feel safe, they feel respected in our company. We're, I mean, we're doing things like with my VP of sales and marketing, you know, changing his, his work schedule to give him a little bit more time off. And the, the next piece, which we, you know, I could talk more about later, is we decided we need to make a major investment in what we call our organizational vitality. So one of our two big pro projects that we undertook this year, something called organizational vitality, where we concluded that if we want to be successful going forward, we have to be the employer of choice in this industry. And that means we've got to create a much more adaptable, thriving culture where people feel truly engaged. And this is going to affect our recruiting, our staffing, our onboarding, our training, our succession planning. We view this as a multi-year multi effort. And I'm just telling you, we're just kind of in the initial stages and we're engaging a lot. But we have over 10% of our staff were involved just in our study group. And we realized this is going to be a key for us to transform our business to the next generation. You know, you mentioned the millennials. That I, my, mine was 100%, so everybody that reports to me are all millennials. So I had a meeting yesterday, and part of the meeting was what is and is not okay to text me. So can, you know what I mean? Like you, know, like you can text me if you're sick, but you can't text me if there's other things going on. I mean, we need to talk. So, and they were like, <laughs> so it was interesting. So, um, go ahead, Mike. So, oh, sorry, Casey. I was thinking about something else. Um, so, um, you know, Boeing. Uh, we we work really hard at making sure our wages and benefits are market leading. So we don't. So, but there's a trap there too. So. Um, and we're um, heavily union, which is based on um, you know service time. The we do have every generation that we went through that Stacy went through, um, and it even though they are broad general generalizations, um, I think that we've all seen exactly what what she was pointing out. And the the thing that we're trying to do specifically at the plant in Portland is is understand how we can engage all of those specifically with changing the way that our, our leaders behave and the way we engage the folks so that we can get that incremental better out of every single person. Um, so the, the wages and benefits, they keep people there, but that doesn't keep people happy or engaged. And, um, and we know that if we don't have that engaged um, team, they don't feel part of the team, they don't feel part of the tradition, they don't feel part that, that we all together create this thriving business and we're going to be here for the next hundred years. Um, we're not going to be here for the next hundred years. So that's the, that's the thing that we're attempting to do is, is change our leadership style and the mindset of the company, or at least in Portland and Helena, so that, um, so that every person is heard, engaged, and is um, challenged so that we can uh, be better and better every day. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Lynn? I think Microchip falls in the same category as, as, as these two companies. We do um, monitor our culture on a regular basis to make sure that we're um, keeping true to our core values. And, and when things come up, we address them so that everybody feels part of Microchip, um, regardless of what the generation they fall into. Uh, we, as Stacy pointed out, certainly fall into the, the group of, of baby boomers and, and older Gen Xers who probably identify themselves as baby boomers based on how they were raised um, because we started in the 80s and 90s. So a lot of our workforce is in that age range where they're going to still be working for a little bit. Uh, we do purposely influx new um, blood, so to speak, with our NCG programs. Uh, so we look for internships so that we can get uh, the younger folk in because we realize that some of those people are going to be retiring or moving on to other organizations uh, and share that knowledge. Uh, we are also uh, challenged with trying to figure out how to keep 
the, the millennials uh, moving forward faster. So again, we use a lot of our culture survey to help us uncover those kinds of situations. Uh, and then we address them as they come up. Microchip is certainly um, a company that hires the best person for the job regardless of their generation. So that's nice and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a good fit. You know, at the bank I work for, our CEO has been there for 50 years. He left college, graduated, and never had another job. So talk about, I mean, you think about what goes on in his mind with all the, the millennials and Generation Xers that are leaving and all that. He just doesn't get it, you know. So it is that weird dynamic, you know. You're like, I've been here eight years. He's like, that's nothing, son. <laughs> you know, I've been here 50, you know. So, so it is weird and it's what Stacy was saying and how all that dynamic is really challenging. So, um, Number four, or question three is number four on my page. Uh, for your industry, can you identify any specific gaps with the workforce in this region? And how do you plan, or what do you recommend to address this? Let's start with, uh, who went first last time? I did. Okay, so let's start with Lynn again. All right. <laughs> um, you know, we don't seem to have too much trouble with the entry level um, other than the ebb and flow. We've worked very closely with WorkSource and Mount Hood Community College over these last um, year, couple of years to give us that good pipeline and help us move through. Where we see um, a struggle is, is on our production supervisor rank. And so we'll need to look at how we grow people internally to move from an entry level position into a lead position into a supervisor position. Uh, because those people skills, as Stacy pointed out, um, are very important and you can train them, but you also have to look for and hire people who will be able to move into those roles. Um, and that seems to be the place where we're struggling right now. Uh, Mike? So I would, um, I would say probably our biggest um, gap right now is skilled, skilled craftsmen, so um, journeyman machinists. So in, uh, in the past, Portland had enough manufacturing base that when we had openings, we had the ability to uh, harvest probably the best because of our, mm -hmm. our, our pay and benefits. Um, and, and harvest was, is, a, is a gentle word. I've had um, a few <laughs> conversations with some of the other machine shops, and, the, and they would get really upset when we went up in rates because we would steal the best. And... Um, and the problem is now is is there aren't those those small shops, there aren't those medium-sized shops anymore. Um, so these folks aren't being trained inside the industry to become these these great machinists. Uh, couple that with the decline of of metal shop, um, people don't even change their oil anymore in their car. Um, you know, so we have had to develop internal training programs. Um, we worked really close with the community colleges. We have been very lucky to get um, some retired folks stay on with us and help us develop these training programs. And then um, we have many folks out on the floor that, that enjoy mentoring the, the high school students or the college students or the, or the new employees that come in and share their, um, their knowledge and skills. So that, that is how we're overcoming it. The, the scary thing is, is, is I was looking at the demographics and inside of this, this journeyman um, um, class, there are 40% of my current um, skilled machinists that are 55 or older today. When I add the folks that are between the age of 50 and 55, that goes up to 69%. So the internal systems that I have don't, they, they will not be able to keep that pipeline full. Um, so we continue to look for ways to do it as well as, you know, whether it's through the policymakers in the state um, or, uh, or our internal systems. But um, that's one of those things that Allison said, boy, that'd keep me awake at night. And it, it does every once in a while. So that's where my gap is. Are you working with, like, lo local high schools? Do you have uh, students come right out of high school and go to Boeing, like internship yeah, programs? Yeah, for, um, for years we've had a program called Tech Prep. Um, we, we take in 12, it's a three-year program, uh, five to six weeks per summer. It's a paid internship. Um, and, uh, and, we, and then we have the ability to direct hire them after that third year. So it's, it's a 16-week a interview 
kind of. And uh, we've been able to uh, find some really, really good folks doing that. It's just the, the volume isn't high enough for, for what we see coming. So. so what's the plan going forward? I mean, if it's not sustainable, what's going on now? How? Well, we have to hit it at every front. So it's, it's continuing to work with the, the community colleges, the schools, um, policymakers to try to get some of the formal or the classes back into the school. And then, um, and then rely on regional. So we, um, and when I'm is state or United States wide. So we've, um, in some of our skills like gear cutter, we've actually um, um, advertised across the United States and pulled people out of um, the South, the East, the whole thing. So we're we're having to go broader and broader to get the folks. What's an average wage for a position of that? Well, the um, after you're you're topped out at a grade eight, it's. Uh, it's 35 bucks an hour and then um, and then some industry leading uh, benefits so okay thank, thank you Mike yep. um, Josh yeah um, I, I have to tell you it was interesting when I was asked to participate in this panel I, I asked my HR director if she would take a first pass at the answers to these questions and uh, you know I was looking at Stacy's you know, presentation and I thought huh I wonder why she and I answer these questions very differently because she's, you know, on the border of being a traditionalist slash a baby boomer. I'm really on the border of being a baby boomer slash Gen X. I see myself more as kind of a Gen X. And, you know, so we had very different answers. So her answer was, you know, at the entry level, we need people to show up to work on time. <laughs> <laughs> right? We, you know, with a great work ethic that they dress, you know, for the job appropriately. I mean, just kind of real, you know, basic fundamental one-on-one stuff. And, and I'd actually suggest that I don't, Amy, you know, is probably is a millennial, she might actually be more in that camp as well, which is, you know, you're showing up to the job, you know, dress right, you know, have the right etiquette, et cetera. You know, for me, I'm really looking at, in our whole staffing process is fit. It's got to start with fit, then aptitude, then skills. Because we feel, I mean, what we found is, you know, if you find someone with the right fit, they're going to stick, right? If they have the aptitude, they'll, they'll not only fit, but, they, you know, they can stick and perform. And then you, you, we have to develop the skills. So what are we, we're finding is, you know, at the entry level, it's, um, you know, we've got a challenge, like anybody else in trucking, of finding CDL drivers. It is really tough for us right now. So that's a strain. Um, I don't have any, anybody's got a silver bullet for me, you know, let me know. That's an issue. Um, with the entry level, it's going to be more on the job training, you know, for, you know, our warehouse employees. Getting into the middle management, this is where this, our organizational vitality project is, I think, going to help us really build the infrastructure for more cross-training, more cross, you know, um, department opportunities. We do have a habit. You know, we've fallen in the trap of you hire somebody for a job and they, they, they stay in that role for, you know, for a very long time. We know that we to motivate people to keep them to stick that we're going to have to give them opportunities to rotate. And we're just beginning that process. Um, then we've got the challenge of, like, how do we take this, the young and up-and-coming leadership and really prepare them for more senior leadership roles? And this is now where we're beginning to tap into industry um, training like the produce marketing association has leadership training providing we've got one young buyer who's just started an mba program trying to be more deliberate and really helping fund you know their education um so that's kind of on the formal end what i'd like to see us do more on the informal side is really really help our staff on leadership development i think this is where really where our biggest challenge is, is. and this is where i think you know i'm going to look to you as a community I found in my own life, you know, in my own career, where I developed my leadership chops was through volunteer work in the community. I think it's an opportunity where people can get out pretty early in their career and get opportunities to step into leadership roles a lot sooner than they might in a job. And so this is something I want to see our staff, particularly the up-and-coming middle and, you know, future senior leaders, get out there and get engaged in the community, take on those roles. I think it, it brings those transferable skills uh, back to our organization. Josh, there's one thing you said that on um, the CDLs. Why do you think it's, I mean, what's holding up people who don't want to get CDLs and drive truck? Is it just it's not a desirable it, you know, job? The, well, well, the trucking, over-the-road trucking is just, it's so, it's very challenging, you know, for um, 
and tighter insurance rules, hours of service rules have become much tighter. It's just it's just becoming a much more regulated industry. So the you know historically, a lot of cowboys became truckers, mm -hmm. and it's not you know the current rules are not that uh, conducive to a cowboy lifestyle. So it's it's a lot more structure, you know, higher insurance rates. So you know, yeah. so we have that challenge. Of how do we make it appealing for us? You know, one thing that's a you know makes us appealing as an employer for drivers is people can come home at night. Yeah. You know, they, right, and that's something, right, truckers hate to have to crash right over in a hotel far from home. And mm -hmm. so providing that, that stability, that ability to go home at night is yeah. helpful. Next question. What characteristics are unique about the workforce in this region that presents a strategic advantage for your company? What can regional partners do to best enhance this advantage for your company and prospective companies in considering our region? I'll start with you again, Josh. Yeah, you know, so we're, we're new to the area. So we've, we've been in the Gresham area only one year. We moved um, from, from the Clackamas area. Um, so I'm gonna have a very short answer on this one. We notice here that we're getting a lot of walk-in candidates. Um, we know that, you know, working in this area, our kind of business, organic produce, just resonates with a lot of young people and, and the notion of being involved in something that promotes health. So that helps, but you know, it, it's a work in progress. So I'll check back with you in a year and I'll tell you what we find. Uh, Mike? So I would say it's probably the, um, the environmental consciousness of the, of the people um, in this region. So, you know, across the globe, the, the United States, there's more and more pressure on, on environmental responsibility. And Boeing's done many things over the last um, half decade to get there. And the, I'll call them kids, um, <laughs> the younger folk that are, um, it, they, they get it. They understand it. It's a value. Um, you don't have to, I, I probably identify more with a baby boomer than, than what this shows me. That I always wanted to see where was, the, where was it on the balance sheet. Why did it make sense, dollar and cents wise? To, to these folks, it's a value, so there's no... Um, there's no convincing that you need to do. So that's, that's a benefit for us. Um, and then I would, I would say it's, it's also just the environment here. You know, you're, you're an hour away from the mountain, you're an hour away from the beach. Um, it's, it's a great living environment for, for the folks. So it, it makes them want to stay and continue to enjoy that. So that helps with the retention as well. And the second part is that the regional partners, the, um, what can regional partners do to enhance the advantage that you have? Well, I, I would probably go back to my uh, my gap in workforce and and the help that I think that my industry could could use with getting uh, manufacturing some level of manufacturing back into core um, the the promotion that manufacturing is a is a great job and that you can make a great um, life out of it and that there's stability in it. That's the other thing that I think scares folks is, is if you go back to uh, 2001 and look at the, the number of manufacturing jobs that have left the country, um, if you're a, a talented person and you're going to Harvard or Yale or Oregon State, um, what, what makes you want to go into manufacturing? Is there, do you have a life in it? Is it going to stay? So. Um, so I think it's the support of the policymakers, the the, and then just the general tone of um, that that we will support manufacturing, that we understand that it's a, a vital job, and that and that it's a good job. I went to Oregon State. I got to get that piece. Harvard, Yale, and Oregon State. <laughs> I bet that's the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> well, no. I, so so no. Case okay, so the reason I say this is I was I, I got a chance to go back to Harvard for an eight week course a couple years ago, and many of the professors kept coming up to me to try to um, understand manufacturing and how we could talk to some of the MBA students that were going through their business school to actually go into manufacturing because none of them were. They were all going to Wall Street. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, and so they were seeing that there was all this, this brain power and potential and none of it was going to the middle America, what keeps it strong mm -hmm. with, with manufacturing. Yeah. So um, that's why I said Harvard no, Yale. Yeah. It wasn't because of anything 
Thanks but for clearing beeps. that up, Mike. Yeah, go Beavs. <laughs> Sorry, Casey. <laughs> There's not anybody in this room would think I went to Harvard or Yale, yeah, believe okay. me. So, <laughs> uh, Lynn? Um, I think I would uh, piggyback off of what Mike has just said about having manufacturing back in, in the schools. I would even uh, question that. Um, adding electronics back to this area is hugely important for what we do in hiring technicians and having that skill set to be able to move into a technician position instead of an entry level position. Um, so I'm going to answer the question backwards a little bit. What you guys can do for us is help us with the electronics piece of it and increase that technical knowledge and help this region understand that electronics isn't TV repair, it's robotics, it's helping um, build semiconductors that go into everything. <laughs> that we use today as a technological uh, economy. And in terms of the first part of that question, what this region brings to us is an experienced workforce. There are other semiconductor companies in this area that bring in skilled talent, and we can harvest <laughs> off of that um, as we need to. Uh, we do have experienced technicians and engineers locally so we don't have to necessarily go outside to get that. And um, the semiconductor companies are, are very, um, I don't know that they trade willingly, but we do beg, borrow, and steal each other's employees quite frequently uh, over the years. The other side of that is that we have a very experienced trade um, contractor group that has clean room experience because working in a clean room is very different than the type of manufacturing that Boeing does. And so having that available allows us to get our work done faster and, and keep our tools up and running. And when we do ramp, be able to deal with that level of construction of bringing in these huge tool sets to a very clean environment. I think the third part of that, because of the semiconductors in the region, we have third party contractors for uh, vendor support for our tool sets and clean room um, maintenance and protocols that in laundry, is every time you take that suit off, it has to get laundered. Um, those kinds of support structures in the, or, in the area, in the local area, keep our costs down so that we don't have to have it in-house and we don't have to send it out of state. So those things help us. Thank you. Okay, I have one final question, and this is one that Josh was, we're not gonna ask this question to you unless you wanna add to it. Um, as we get the other two have answered. Um, in your industry, how are changing the way you manage your workforce? What tools, resources, and partners have been effective in this management? Let's start with Mike. So I've said it a number of times, but I think our relationships with the community college, Mount Hood, um, has been invaluable as far as within our apprenticeship program as well as um, getting a number of our, of our, of our machinists and, and craftsmen in. Um, developing, continuing to develop those relationships with the local high schools um, and, the, and the charter schools so that we can um, continue to get those folks um, um, as well. You know, and then, and then at a state, state level, the, the policymakers and, and aggression level of policymakers on, um, on keeping it as business friendly as makes sense to do, you know, understanding that there is an absolute balance required between uh, business and, and the community um, continues to make Gresham a, a, a very good place to, to have um, Boeing, so. Mm -hmm. good. Thank you. Lynn? Internally, uh, the types of changes that we've brought into place over time is our communication processes. Um, because we're a satellite site, we've had to get on board with technology and collaboration, and so we employ a lot of collaboration type tools uh, with SharePoint and video conferencing, and uh, I even put up a, our very first blog, so <laughs> we're, we're trying. Um, from the other side of it, we also instituted a learning management system that allows us to have knowledge available at, um, at the learner's desire instead of a scheduled event or, or having it be very planned out. We now have things available 24-7 uh, because we are a 24-7 operation. And that allows them to get the knowledge when they want it and when they need it versus um, me having to work 24-7. <laughs> I'm not pretty at 3 o'clock in the morning, let me just tell you. <laughs> in terms of our external um, 
methods of, of how we've done things in this last couple of years. We've really looked at our hiring process uh, for how we bring in entry level, and we've worked very closely with WorkSource and Mount Hood Community College in getting the right um, fit for our organization um, because that's important. Mm -hmm and having them come in and, and be, be the right person for microchip. So that's helped as well. We've also started doing internships for the University of Oregon, sorry, um, and uh, OSU as well. And we just, we, this, this last year we just did SummerWorks uh, internship program, uh, which was very uh, helpful in helping us reach out to the community and see that younger workforce that's coming in. Do you find the OSU students to be a little more advanced than the U of <laughs> I plead the fifth. So, I just want to get it out there. I mean. so, so, so Casey, um, one other thing that I wanted to, that I forgot to mention too is, is, you know, the internship programs that we have, whether it's an engineering internship, but we also have a very close relationship with Portland State. They've got a, uh, a phenomenal supply chain um, um, program over there. And, and as you can imagine, I mean, we buy raw material parts, um, systems from around the world and it is a big huge part of our business so the the folks that we have whether it's through internships or hired out of internship from portland state they've just been some phenomenal folks so that's another great relationship did you want to add anything josh i, I would just add i mean actually we had a capstone team from portland state this past year who did they did a project with our company in new seasons and I've worked with some pretty, you know, expensive consultants in my day, and this group did a phenomenal job. I mean, real value added. So, and I'm looking at that group thinking, you know, as we're building out our management over time, you know, I'm looking at that as a talent pool. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, in, in the past, worked closely with Clackamas Community College when we were in Clackamas on, on you know, basic workforce training. Um, we also work, we're partly owned by an employee stock ownership plan. And this is a resource that's more of a national resource. The National Center for Employee Ownership is a great, great resource. Not only if you're thinking about, you know, business ownership transition and, and think about setting up an ESOP, but a lot of their work is actually on organizational development and building ownership cultures. And so we, you know, we tap them for, you know, for resources. Um, so and our job, our job, you know, mm -hmm. as a company here in Gresham is to not to look to this community and go, what can you do for us? I mean, I, you know, we're grateful to be here. I mean, the city of Gresham really put out the, the, the welcome mat to, to, mm -hmm. and made our transition easy. I think our job as an employer is to figure out what we need and then, you know, talk to the Office of Economic Community Development and Mount Hood Community College and get guidance. Like, are we asking the right questions about what we need to do for workforce development? You know, are there resources that we don't know about that we should be, be tapping and make it a much more of an integrated, you know, uh, interactive process rather than, you know, yeah. what was us, you know, we need to hire and train people. I want to see us be much more interactive with, with the community and, and the institutions and figure out how to develop a, a plan that works for both. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Okay, we have about 10 minutes, so I believe Barb and Shelley are going to have microphones. And so if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, we have... Uh, Malcolm in the corner. Oh, we got one right there. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, Malcolm, can you stand so everybody in the room can? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, w one of the things I want to address is, the, is I'm going to use manufacturing as an example. Uh, there's a lot of perception is a big I issue with uh, attracting work uh, uh, workforce. Um, and in the case of manufacturing, you alluded to something that we've seen a decline in manufacturing over 30, 40 years. What people don't understand is, is that manufacturing is still a significant segment of our economy, and at 170,000 jobs in Oregon at a 5% turnover rate, you're producing around 9,000 jobs a year that need to be replaced every year. That's, even with a negative uh, growth rate, you're producing more jobs than many companies that are, produce, that are growing at double digits. That is a misperception that you lose a lot of workers. The other, the other perception that is dealt with here is the fact that uh, manufacturing is very up and down in terms of it's very cyclical in its nature of hiring and letting blame people off. So much so that now HR managers, one of their biggest issues is how do we manage contingent workers 
And what does this do to people wanting a stable job if they're seeing that, that industries like manufacturing are going more to the side of contingent workforce rather than full-time, long-term workforce? How do you manage that, that perception? So um, it, it's pretty easy on the second one because we don't, we don't hire part-time or contingent because it's a uh, union here in, in Portland. So um, the, the cyclical, I think that if you went back um, 10 annual reports ago in the Boeing annual report, you, you could absolutely say that it was a cyclical. Every eight years, it, it was trough to peak. And, um, but if you look at from 2002 and on, it is a, a ever increasing slope. And when we take a look at our, our 20 year outlook, there's four and a half trillion dollars worth of airplanes that need to be made in the next 20 years. So the, the outlook within at least airplanes is um, so good it's almost scary. And it's how are we going to do the work? Um, I don't know how you, how you um, turn around the perception that manufacturing um, is not a good, long, stable job. I mean, I've been in it for 25 years, and yeah, there's been some challenges, but it's been more growth and more opportunity, and it's it's been more of okay, we're gonna we're gonna go after this golden ring and let the silver one go. You know, it's picking which opportunities we're gonna go after. So I I, I don't know how you how you attack it at a at a state or a or a United States level to to get the manufacturing appeal back. I think in semiconductors it is certainly cyclical, but I've been employed for 20 years in the industry. So I think when you find the right company and you find the right fit um, and you work hard, those kinds of those cyclical ups and downs kind of even itself out. Um, we have recently started hiring temp employees for our entry level, but we um, use that as a screening tool to make sure we have the right fit. And once they've, uh, if industry supports it and economic growth is there, uh, certainly we look at converting them when we can. Uh, and if they're a good fit and the, the worker that shows up on time and is dressed correctly and all of that other stuff that's out there as well. So the perception thing is tough. If I knew how to fix that, I'd write the book and be retired, but I'm not there yet. So. Well, don't you think it starts in the household a little bit and then with the schooling? I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm not telling my kids, hey, when you grow up, go to Boeing, right? I mean, I just, so, it's not the, the and, I, the, and when you tell me what the, the wage is, that's a very good wage for a worker, but yeah. those conversations aren't taking place in, in the homes. Well, so is it, how many people in here have gone to like a first robotics? Is, is it, well, so. <laughs> So one of the funny things is you go in there and the, and the first thing that they start talking about to kids is, is that engineering is an awesome thing and that society has not done a good thing portraying who and what engineers are. I mean, they're, whether it's the goofy shows on TV, you know, they're always the geeks <laughs> and the goofballs and this, or they're the mad scientists, or, you know, yeah. it's the image of what it is. And that's, we, we have to work to change the perception of manufacturing, just like we're trying to do with engineering through FIRST Robotics, so. Do you have anything to add, Josh? I'll get myself in trouble. Okay, okay. <laughs> Jim, you have a question? Morning. Uh, this question's for Josh. My name is Kyle with KG Specialties, and I really enjoyed what you had to say about volunteer and how that leads into leadership. Um, it's one of the things that I wish I would have been introduced to a lot earlier in my life, uh, volunteer work. So my question to you is, what are you doing internally to foster volunteer within your team and to get them out there in the field to do more of that to see who the leaders will to rise to the top. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We, we you know, question about what are we doing about promoting volunteerism in our company. We, at this point, we have a program where we um, offer, we pay eight, eight hours a, um, a year. We typically, uh, it's not fully tapped. We'll have teams that will go out, particularly a bunch of millennials, that will do work like, uh, I think at Blue Lake this past fall, we had a whole work party. 
I think, you know, for me, it's, it's really underdeveloped. As part of this, we talked about organizational vitality and building the, the leaders of the future. I think it's going to be part of the conversation. So, you know, I'm talking to some of the younger managers. We have a very talented young man who joined us a couple of years ago as director of account management and sales. And he asked me one day, he said, you know, I really want to get engaged in the community. And I said, absolutely, you know, let me use my, you know, role because I've, you know, no people in the community to help you. You know, and I'm, I'm keeping after him because unless as a manager, you know, in my role as CEO, I'm challenging, you know, the younger leaders to get involved, they're going to go, well, it doesn't really matter. So I have to, I think in my role, I have to model that, that expectation. Right now, it's still a little bit kind of catch as catch can. There's some people who are stepping up and doing it and others not. But what I find is, I mean, you know, we have an individual in my company who's our director of sustainability and trade advocacy who, I mean, since her early 20s has been in, you know, volunteer roles. She has now already developed, she's got a national reputation. She actually started a nonprofit. Um, we've got about 40, 50 companies in the organic food trade that are involved. And what's happening is that, she, I mean, she is becoming a go-to resource. And, you know, people look at her and go, you're a future leader of this company. And I think, you know, she's modeling the behavior that I think others in the organization go, huh, how did she do it? I want to be like her. And I think you're just, those opportunities are going to materialize as a result. We have just a, I, I, we have one more question? Or we're, okay, we, one more really quick question. Okay, thanks, Jim. We're, no, okay. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Casey. Good morning, Jim Schlachter, Gresham Bartle School District. Uh, in the education sector, as we work with our many employees, one of the issues that we're often asked to pay attention to is diversity in the workforce. Uh, our students are a very diverse group, and having educa educators that look like them and sometimes have similar cultural experiences is seen as an advantage. How does that play out in your workspace in terms of diversity? And I would add, if it is an issue, how do you recruit for diversity? Uh, well, <laughs> you take it first. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, at Microchip, um, I guess when you look across our group, it is a very diverse group. We have um, specialists from all over the world working in our fab. We have engineers from all over the world working in our facilities um, because we go after looking for the best person for the job, not their culture not how, how are they going to fit in microchips culture regardless of, of their external look. Um, so I, I, when I look around, I mean, I don't know that we've ever really done a, a diversity survey in our organization, but it's, it's a very big melting pot. So I think they would find very, uh, a lot of comfort uh, at microchip. So Jim, we, um we have targets that we shoot for. We do an annual survey, and we have plans where we have underutilization. Um, and as a leadership team, we, we recognize that we have a specific population, Southeast Asia, Vietnamese, um, where we were having problems with trying to get the, the, the folks to volunteer or to express desire to be leaders. And um, one of the things that we recognized were, was the absence of leaders to to um, mentor or to pave the way to show that it was okay. So we have um, through the Executive Leadership Institute, which um, is a um, organization that that mentors and develops um, Asian cultures. We've been putting folks through that over the last few years, and one of the expectations when I sit down and, and we do a down select because it's great. We always have more people that want to do it than we have spots to do it. And when we go through the down select and all sit down and have a conversation with them is, is that my expectation is, is as they go through this um, and when they're finished, that they are the bridge and they work to communicate and, and tie in with the, the folks out on the floor to, to pave that way or form that bridge so that we can get more and more um, diversity in the leadership team. I'll be real quick. So, you know, with respect to diversity, um, w one thing that I, I will just share with you, my opinion is that, you know, kind of the, the gender mix is not a, an issue for me. 
Um, I think that in time our company is going to be, the majority of our leadership are going to be women. Um, I think if you just look at the demographics of who's in school, you know, getting undergraduate, graduate degrees, this is, um, it's just going to be, for me it's going to be a non-issue and I'm, I'm glad I'm, I've been alive to see that, that happen. In terms, in terms of our ethnic and racial diversity, I, I don't think we do a good enough job. You know, it's, it's definitely evolved and, you know, we're seeing more diversity on the front line, particularly since we've moved into Gresham. Um, but as part of our OV, our Organizational Vitality Project, we got to make it more deliberate. A lot of our hiring is through, is through referrals. It's through the, we call it the Friends and Family Network, which is wonderful, right? I mean, that's a sign of a health, you know, healthy and bright environment that you got referrals. The downside is that it's everybody kind of looks and acts like everybody else. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we have. I want everybody to please thank Lynn, Mike, and Josh for being our panel today. Uh, so now you're going to have about 25 minutes to uh, a break to get to meet people and network and have coffee and water. Thank you.